2,500 years ago this month, there was a major sea battle in the Mediterranean. This was the Battle of Salamis, one of the most important and historically significant battles in the history of Europe. You don't really need to know about the Battle of Agincourt to enjoy a performance of Shakespeare's Henry V, or indeed the Battle of Actium before you see Antony and Cleopatra. These plays were written hundreds, thousands of years after the historical events that happen in the background. But what about Sean O'Casey and the plays he wrote for the Abbey Theatre? The Plough and the Stars happens during the chaos of the 1916 Rising, and it was written only ten years later. The Shadow of a Gunman and Juno and the Paycock were both written only a couple of years after Ireland's War of Independence, even closer to their historical setting. Plays and other artworks that emerge from times of war and other crisis sometimes take their time to appear, because artists and audiences need time. When we think of theatre in ancient Athens, we might imagine men in robes, perhaps discussing philosophy as they walk through a stoa, on their way to see a day's worth of plays at the theatre. But the Athens of 472 BC, when the Persians was written and first performed, was still in recovery. Less than a decade earlier, it had been destroyed during a huge Persian invasion. The Acropolis was burned to the ground and the city ransacked. It would be decades before the reconstruction was completed, but the outpouring of creativity and expression that came about gave birth simultaneously to developments in politics, philosophy, sculpture and, of course, theatre, that became the cornerstones of Western culture. And if the Battle of Salamis had not gone the way it did, the world might be a very different place. The conflict between the Greeks and the Persians spanned quite a few decades before this landmark battle. Persia, at the time the largest empire the world had ever known, was ruled by Darius. The story of how Darius came to the throne is very dramatic and sounds almost worthy of discussion on my other show, The Hamlet Podcast. It involves kings being murdered by their brothers, infected wounds, imposters and usurpers. The most significant ruler before Darius was Cyrus the Great, an extremely important figure for Persians then and to this day. He was succeeded by Cambyses and then by someone called Smerdis, who was also known as Bardia, and may even have been a wizard called Gaumata. Eventually, Darius found his way to the throne and became the next king of kings. Crucially, he also married Atossa, the daughter of Cyrus the Great. This meant that their son, Xerxes, had real legitimacy as the next generation of the Achaemenid Empire. In short, Cyrus the Great followed by Cambyses, followed by a whole lot of trouble, followed by Darius. If this was the kind of unrest at the very top of the Persian Empire, you can imagine that there was squabbling elsewhere. Babylon was a consistently troublesome city, and there were frequent rebellions there, but what's most important for us is the Ionian region, the western edges of the Persian Empire, the area that is now Turkey on the Mediterranean coast. Starting in 499 BC, the cities of Ionia began to rebel against Persian rule. The people there were predominantly Greek and didn't take kindly to Persian domination, and so they fought back. One of the key successes of this revolt was the destruction of the city of Sardis, where the local rebels were supported, among others, by the city of Athens. Sardis was a very strategic city and the beginning of the Royal Road, the major thoroughfare that crossed the empire to the city of Persepolis, one of the major capitals. According to Herodotus, the Greek historian to whom we owe much of what we know, when Darius heard that Sardis had burned, he firstly asked who these meddling Athenians were, and then swore an oath to have revenge on them for destroying the city. Given that he had such an enormous empire to manage, it's not too surprising that it took him a while to act on this. But legend has it that he employed a slave to remind him three times a day, remember the Athenians. By 492, Darius was ready and sent out his first campaign against Greece. Now, it's worth noting that the country we now call Greece didn't exist. Think of it instead as a collection of city-states, 
Darius's forces made some headway, but storms got in the way, so it wasn't entirely successful. Before he sent a second military expedition, he sent ambassadors to all of the Greek city-states, insisting on their surrender. Almost all of them complied, all except Athens and Sparta. These two cities opted instead to execute these ambassadors, and this was all Darius needed to motivate him to send out a second wave of Persian forces. The mighty army of Persia set sail for Greece, island hopping across the Aegean towards these Athenians he was so eager to punish. They destroyed the city of Eritrea, another of those who had helped in the Ionian revolt, and eventually they landed on the mainland at Marathon. Despite their might, the Persians were driven back by the Athenians, and the myth of a messenger running the 26 miles from Marathon back to Athens with the news persists to this day. The Persians pulled up their anchors and set sail for Athens instead, making as if to sail around Cape Sunion, but the Athenians rushed back and managed to prevent any hope of their landing. The Persians sailed home, and Athens was left to bury the heroic dead of the Battle of Marathon. If Darius was angry at Athens before the defeat at Marathon, he was really furious now. He determined to put together an army the like of which the world had never seen, to return and rout these Athenian upstarts once and for all. As I mentioned earlier, the Persian Empire was vast and prone to uprisings, and one burst forth in Egypt, also under Persian control, before the army was fully ready to return to Greece. While Darius was preparing to march on Egypt and subdue that rebellion, he died. His successor, Xerxes, was not Darius's first-born son, but he was the first-born child of Darius and Atossa, and as a result he was the one chosen to succeed and become king of kings. More importantly, he was also the one who had to lead the Persian forces when they were finally ready to return to the west, to Greece, and to Athens. Xerxes put together a huge army and a navy, and enlisted soldiers and fighters from all over his empire. The display must have been incredibly impressive, as his vast horde marched across the Persian Empire, proudly focused on vengeance for their previous defeat. As they made for Greece, they had to cross the Hellespont, the strait of water symbolically separating Europe and Asia. The story goes that Xerxes created a bridge by having several ships line up side by side for his whole army to cross over into Europe and make their progress, through Thrace, down through Macedonia, while the fleet hugged the coast by the sea. Word obviously reached the Greeks that Xerxes and his vast army were approaching, and first contact was made at the Battle of Thermopylae. This battle was famous for the participation of the 300 Spartan hoplites led by Leonidas, who helped to fend off the Persians until they were tricked and betrayed from the rear. At the same time as the Battle of Thermopylae, a sea battle at Artemisium likewise fended off the Persian attack, but it was a delay rather than a defeat. Xerxes' forces were too powerful, and the army made its way down through Euboea, Boeotia and into Attica, before eventually reaching Athens. Completing his father's mission, Xerxes made sure that Athens was burned to the ground. The Athenians knew he was coming, however, and they had evacuated to the island of Salamis. Even though Athens was ransacked, the Greeks did not give up, and their navy was intact. It was September, the end of the sailing season. If there wasn't a decisive victory now, it might have to wait until the spring, as the seas would be rough during the winter. So Xerxes was drawn into a sea battle in the straits beside Salamis, and the Greeks, infinitely superior sailors, won a decisive victory. It didn't help that significant numbers of those Persian forces did not know how to swim. Against all odds, the Persian forces were soundly beaten, and Xerxes withdrew the majority of his remaining forces. He left a smaller army behind, led by his commander Mardonius, and made the long journey home to the capital in defeat. The following year, at the Battle of Plataea, Mardonius was also defeated. The Persians never again tried to invade Greece. The Battle of Salamis, this extraordinary victory snatched from the jaws of what should have been defeat, has had an impact we can barely measure. 
If Xerxes and his forces had taken over, it would have been Persian rather than Athenian culture that dominated in the years and centuries that followed. Persian culture was sophisticated and complicated and ancient, and indeed Xerxes' grandfather Cyrus had created the world's first declaration of human rights. But the events at Salamis gave the victory to Athens, and led instead to the flowering of Athenian culture in the 5th century BC. For decades afterwards, people even measured their age in relation to Xerxes' campaign. Nobody asked how old you were, so much as how old were you when the Persians came. The repeated conflicts with Persia were constantly on the Athenians' minds. In 472 BC, just eight years after the Battle of Salamis, and seven years after the Battle of Plataea, a plucky young politician decided to sponsor a set of tragedies for the festival of Dionysus. That politician was Pericles, who would go on to lead Athens through one of the most impressive periods in the city's history. The playwright he sponsored was Aeschylus. Even though the majority of plays up to that point had been about gods and heroes and Greek mythology, there had been occasional plays about historical fact. A few years earlier, Another great playwright, called Phrynichus, had written a play about the sack of the city of Miletus, but it was so distressing to Athenian audiences that it was banned from future performance. The same Phrynichus had also written a play about Persia, in which he apparently had a chorus of Persian women lamenting the loss of their men in the wars. In 472, Aeschylus wrote his Persian play, part of a trilogy of tragedies, that may well have all dramatised aspects of the Persian invasion just eight years before. It might have seemed like a poisoned chalice, accepting a commission from a seriously ambitious politician, but Aeschylus's response, and the way he went about discussing these events, is very subtle indeed. Here's Professor Edith Hall, whose text and translation of the play was the basis for this project. She has written several books about how the Greeks interacted with those they called barbarians, and about cultural responses to the Persian Wars. Here I've asked her about how Aeschylus went about writing a Persian play for Athens. I think it, I think it is very complex, and I think we actually have to hand it to Aeschylus that uh, he um, did manage to make a complicated, uh, dramatic response to what was really, a, I think, a very kind of jingoistic commission, if you see what I mean. So yeah. we have Pericles is the guy who funds it, and he's you know, a fairly young politician in the same family as Themistocles, and, and he wants to uh, get identified as, as, as sort of uh, from the family that were the heroes of defending you know, Greek freedom. So Aeschylus' response was absolutely not to mention any names, you know, even Themistocles, the great hero of the whole battle of Salamis is not mentioned um, and there's very little sort of specific um, celebration of um, the glory that was classical democratic Athens in the battle of Salamis. It's all done at something of a distance. I mean, it certainly is there, but I think the most important thing to me is that all tragedy is about uh, eliciting emotions. In the, in the spectators and the emotions that are elicited through the incredible clusters of uh, emotive words and uh, laments um, the music and so on will have also played the part we know that from the way the chorus talk about the music is that the emotions of loss and, and sacrifice and wreckage were actually shared entirely by the Athenians I mean they had lost a very considerable number of people. They'd had their whole city sat. They'd had their beloved Acropolis with its beautiful old temples burned to the ground. Uh, many of them will have been badly injured. There'll have been people with, you know, one leg and no eye and all the rest of it. And almost every family will have uh, been bereaved. So I think it allowed uh, what a modern psychoanalyst would call projection by um, making the Persians, the enemy, undergo these sorts of emotions. It did actually allow the Athenians to process their own emotions at a sort of safe distance that was also tinged with the comfort of knowing that they'd won. <laughs> and I think that's actually a really interesting project that these killers came up with um, in response to a very difficult commission. Aeschylus' dramatic response to the Battle of Salamis and his depiction of the Persians 
would have been under heavy scrutiny. He himself had fought at the Battle of Marathon, and we can assume that he was an eyewitness to the events of Salamis too. He wasn't the only one. I asked Professor Oliver Taplin, one of the world's leading experts on Greek tragedy, to talk about how the Athenians in the audience would also have been the veterans and survivors of Salamis. Absolutely. They, they, they would have fought in those battles. They, some of them would have uh, lost relatives. Uh, all of them would know that the Persians had uh, burnt their Acropolis, uh, destroyed their Acropolis, um, and would have destroyed them if they'd been able to. So they were in a position where you might have expected them to, uh, to have wanted to be vindictive to have shown what absolute bastards those Persians were, what barbarian uh, infidels they were, to try and destroy them, to try and destroy their temples. Um, and yet, that, that isn't the way the play treats them. That's, that's the great, uh, the extraordinary surprise of this play. It's hard to overemphasise just how surprising this play must have been. Sandwiched between two plays that dealt less directly with the Persian expeditions, Aeschylus presents his audience with a sense of how it must have been to hear the news of this great defeat. Not only that, it's worth bearing in mind that as his audience sat in the theatre of Dionysus, on the southwest slopes of the Acropolis, they could see the sea out in the distance. And out there, a little over 20 kilometres away, they could still see Salamis. The play begins, like so many Greek tragedies, with the entrance of the chorus. In this play, they are the Persian elders, the old councillors left behind as everyone of fighting age went off to subdue the Athenians. We're going to start with them tomorrow night, and I hope you'll join me then. Persians, the podcast, is supported by the Arts Council, and is broadcast as part of Dublin Theatre Festival 2020. This evening you heard contributions from Edith Hall and Oliver Taplin with signature music by Mel Mercier. The project has been produced by Maura O'Keefe and is written and presented by yours truly, Conor Hanrity. You can find the show on all podcast platforms and at our website, persiansthepodcast.com. No.